Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us live, or perhaps you're watching this recording at a later time. We are thrilled to welcome you to really our first webinar to kick off our recruitment for the class of 2025 for the MBA for Executives program at the Yale School of Management. My name is Joanne Legler, and I'm the Director of Admissions for the MBA for Executives program at Yale, and I'm joined by each and every one of my admissions colleagues today, and I'll let them introduce themselves, and then we'll go ahead and get started with our content. So Liz, would you mind please first starting us off? Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Liz Lewis. I am one of the Assistant Directors of Admissions for the MBA for Executives program. So great to see you all here today. Thanks, Liz. David. Hi, everyone. My name is David Daniel. I'm also an Assistant Director of Admissions here in the MBA for Executives program. Uh, and it's great to see you. And I'm really excited as we uh, start to get to know the class of 2025 over the, the next uh, several months and really over the next year. So welcome. David and Emily. Hi, all. My name is Emily Whitehouse. I'm the Associate Director of Admissions for the MBA for Executives program. So excited to join my colleagues here today and all of you. Looking forward to chatting with you over the next hour or so. Great. Thank you, team. It's great to have you all here with us. And it's great to be able to introduce all of the admissions team to anyone who's attending our webinar or watching the recording later. We have quite an agenda for today, but really this is the most high level overview of, hey, I think I want to do an EMBA type of webinar that we offer. So we're excited to answer your questions in general. And then of course, interweave information about the MBA for Executives program at Yale SOM into our discussion of your consideration points for thinking about maybe doing an MBA in the very near future. Um, so we do have the whole, time, the whole team here together in the next 35, 40 minutes or so. Our intention is to walk through the points of consideration, tell you a little bit more about our program, and then answer any questions that you might have. So if you do feel like you've got questions for the admissions team, go ahead and feel free to either put those in the Q&A and we'll try to answer those in real time as you might have them or save them and throw them in the chat. And if you have questions and it makes sense for us to answer them as we go along, we will, or perhaps we'll go ahead and save a few minutes towards the end of our webinar today to answer those questions all at one time. So again, thank you for being here. Looking forward to hearing what you wanna learn a little bit more about. And Here's our agenda for today. Really, like we said, this is a great introduction to what do I need to think about? What do I need to consider as I'm thinking about potentially diving into an EMBA program? We'll talk about alignment and alignment means many things for us, lots of layers here in terms of timing, in terms of profile, in terms of the kind of program that you might be looking for. Uh, most of the programs that we consider ourselves peer to or with our campus-based programs. And a consideration is, how am I gonna get there? What does that format look like? What's the calendar for the two years in the EMBA program? Am I prepared? And that means everything from getting your house in order at work to getting your actual house in order at home. Who are your stakeholders? Who do you need to sort of prepare as well for you to consider doing the MBA? And then finally, the topic that's probably on everybody's mind is how am I going to finance the degree? Like I said, towards the end, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. So don't be shy. Go ahead and put those in the chat or in the Q&A and we're happy to help. So who is an EMBA for? Why are you here today to learn a little bit more about the EMBA program? Truly, regardless of what EMBA program you might be considering, an MBA in the executive format is truly for experienced leaders. In our case, specifically, our students have about 14 years of working experience. It is a mid-level uh, opportunity for those who are starting to get a little more responsibility at work, finding themselves in positions of leadership uh, where an MBA makes sense at this point in the career. We're also looking for students who have some demonstrated career evolution. An EMBA may not be the best choice for somebody who's just getting started or perhaps in their first entry level job, but instead as someone who's moved forward on the path of responsibility uh, and uh, leadership in their organizations, maybe they're managing people, projects, or even full teams or beyond. And then acceleration and access. And what that means for us is that opportunity to grow in your capacity, to learn more about how you can be a better leader and access the resources that are available in an EMBA program, particularly the one at SOM. And we'll talk a little bit more about what those opportunities are, but this is an opportunity I think for a degree where growth and impact is most meaningful in that mid-career space. Specifically for SOM, we always think that any discussion of our school always has to start with or include 
a discussion about our mission. And our mission, as you can see here, is to educate leaders for business and society. Leaders who are thinking really broadly about the most difficult problems that any industry might be facing. As you can see, this is very intentional, the two. It is educating leaders for business and society. And the and is important there too. We definitely believe that the biggest problems in business or the biggest problems in society can't be solved without the other element. So for us, it is our founding mission. It's always been our mission and will continue to be so. If this resonates with you, you're probably in the right place. For us as staff, faculty, and students, you could probably find anybody at SOM for whom this mission resonates. They can rattle it off with ease. It's meaningful to them. And SOM is very unique in being such a mission-oriented institution. So if this sounds good to you, if this works for you, like I said, welcome to SOM. You're probably in the right place. I'm going to now turn it over to my colleague, Emily to go through a walkthrough of the curriculum. And again, when we're talking about considerations for an EMBA program, these are consideration points. Are you aligned with uh, a mission? And then let's talk a little bit about alignment as it relates to our unique curriculum. So Emily, take it away. Yeah, thank you so much, Joanne. And so in offering this overview of the curriculum, I'd like to spend some time on focusing on that unique structure of Yale SOM's MBA for Executives program. And this is to serve to answer those questions you may have, such as what will I be learning and when? And here you'll see a clear visual representation of how your two years will be spent in the program. In blue, the academic experience you'll see is 75% general management. And in green, the remaining 25% is focused on either healthcare, asset management, or sustainability. And so I'll get into those three key areas of focus in just a moment. But first and foremost, I'll focus on the blue there. So over the span of your two years in the program, you'll engage in leadership development through a curriculum of mandatory core courses, coupled with optional sessions on leadership topics and hands-on training through a variety of workshops. Leadership development is focused on building skills on multiple levels as an individual, as well as within teams, organizations, and more globally. And in year one, students will engage in an integrated core curriculum, which is focused through lenses of a number of organizational perspectives. And this is one of the most important differentiators of this program and how you'll begin your academic experience. If we're to educate leaders for business and society, we have, we have to have leaders that are both offering a broad view and a deep understanding of their workforce, their customers, and how to innovate and shift as markets do, and how to understand how organizations create and change policy at a municipal, state, national, and at the global level, and how to think like an investor. And so in year two, our students will build on this foundational knowledge in the advanced management courses. And this offers an opportunity to kind of build on those skills that they already have, to develop in strategic approaches, business skills, and competencies needed to lead within an organization. And so then nestled in between years one and two, you'll have an incredible opportunity to engage in the Global Network for Advanced Management, which is a network of 32 schools, of which Yale is a founding member, for a Global Network Week. And Global Network Weeks offer students an opportunity to engage with peers around the globe through an intensive week-long course, leveraging the perspectives, programs, and faculty expertise of that school. So our students will join with other executive MBA students from Global Network schools around the globe. And this might involve attending classes, collaborating on team projects, touring local businesses, and hearing from visiting business leaders as well. And then turning your attention now to the colloquium down below, you'll have an opportunity here to hear from a suite of colloquium speakers, thoughtfully curated by a faculty director for your specific area of focus. And these speakers will offer some amazing insights into the leadership of each industry, the challenges and changes they've led through, and opportunities they see on the horizon. And now, we'll go ahead and dive into each area of focus a bit, as it's another unique aspect of our MBA for Executives program. And so we're gonna spend a little bit of time 
discussing these three areas of focus, asset management, healthcare, and sustainability. And these are distinct features of the second year curriculum. And the area of focus courses do make up 25% of the overall curriculum. And so if you're thinking about applying to the program, and if this program does align with your goals, you'll wanna be sure that you're clear on the content and the curriculum for each area of focus. And to make sure that these things align with your goals and career to date and your current role. And to do this, I'd recommend checking out our website and viewing our focus area webinars to learn a little bit more about each topic. And when you do apply, which I hope you do, if this program aligns with you, it's important that you show a demonstrated commitment to one of these areas. And this means having a career evolution and current role that is closely connected to either asset management, healthcare, or sustainability. And so the photos you see here illustrate some of the things that may come to mind when you think about each focus area. But know that these representations are really just the tip of the iceberg. So let's dive in. So for asset management, you might assume this area of focus serves those in the financial industry within the wealth management space. And while this is true, you'll also see a broad range of roles, industry functions, leadership experience, and areas of expertise from those in private equity, venture capital, traditional portfolio managers, the regulatory sector, risk and compliance, mergers and acquisitions, FinTech and consultancy. And the same goes for healthcare. The genesis of both our program and this area of focus was geared toward practitioners mostly, but it's evolved greatly to include those in biotech, big pharma, insurance, medical devices, population health, health equity, life sciences, and those from organizations that serve in the healthcare system in varying capacities. And so then sustainability is perhaps the broadest because all industries and sectors have become acutely aware of the environmental impact of their organization and wish to make a positive change. And while we don't always see those with titles like director of sustainability or corporate social responsibility, we are seeing more organizations leaning into these roles more. And many of our students come from energy, oil and gas, consumer goods, supply chain, manufacturing, as well as government policy and nonprofit spaces. And then pivoting to talk a little bit about our current class um, and our the alignment of our SOM profile and seeing if this also kind of resonates with you. So on my final note, before turning it over to my colleague, David, um, I'd like to share a little bit about the class of 2023. And so you'll see here um, an average of 14 years of work experience. And this reflects our students' timing for an MBA for executives program as they approach positions of leadership and greater responsibility. And you'll also note that we are nearing gender parity. Half of our students also have other professional degrees though this isn't a prerequisite, it does add to that richness of the classroom experience for sure. And our students are diverse, representing 14 citizenships. And the average age of our students is 37, um, though you'll see a blend of more early career and more advanced career peers in the mix. And so now I'll go ahead and turn it over to my colleague David for our next key consideration. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, so as you consider uh, embarking on an MBA for Executives program, a really important thing to think about is uh, where's your program and how are you going to get there? Um, how are you going to get to campus? And so uh, I'll talk a little bit more about us and our program and what that looks like in depth uh, and also what that means for your experience while you're here as well. So uh, for our program, Yale School of Management is, of course, within Yale University here in New Haven. Uh, and, and so New Haven as our home is really conveniently located about halfway between New York and Boston. Uh, very, very accessible from Washington DC, Boston, New York by train or by car. But we also get students coming from all over North America who, you know, Thursday night or Friday morning of the class weekend, and we'll talk about what that looks like in a couple of minutes, but we'll, we'll you know, hop into their cars or planes, trains, automobiles, everything and make their way here to New Haven. And there are many options for how to get here. Um, 
you know, for us in New Haven, many of our students are coming in from, uh, you know, airports in New York, they might fly into Hartford, there's actually uh, the airport here in New Haven itself is growing. Again, lots uh, of ways to, to uh, access us here in New Haven. Um, and one thing that we found is that being right outside of a major metropolitan area, that's of course New York City, uh, as, is a real benefit to us because uh, not only does it make us uh, very accessible, it's very easy to get here, but it's also nice that we're, we're uh, a little bit more of a, of a suburb to New York in some ways, uh, although some people might not appreciate that characterization, but uh, you know, uh, you have the ability to come here to Yale University very easily, but then while you're here, be really connected to your peers to take advantage of everything that Yale has to offer, that our colleagues in the program office team put together in terms of optional events on Friday nights, workshops on Saturday, where you really get the opportunity to, to take part in the life of the school. And one thing I'd encourage you to think about both for our program, but generally is, you know, get a sense of what your, your commute to your program is gonna look like. If that's us, you know, definitely, uh, if, if we have the opportunities to have in-person events in the fall, which we are optimistic, we hope that we might, if we do, take the opportunity to come visit us, do a dry run of what that commute can, can uh, what you can expect from that commute. Um, but uh, with that, I'm gonna talk about another option that we have to offer a degree of flexibility to the program and that's our extended classroom. So uh, the extended classroom is something that we piloted uh, many years ago, pre-pandemic, uh, with the idea that it would add a little bit of flexibility when for, you know, one class weekend, you might need to stay a little closer to home or when the weather doesn't cooperate with your travel plans or, you know, of course, when a global pandemic hits, uh, you know, the extended classroom is uh, there to occasionally offer some flexibility uh, when you're unable to make it to campus. And so that it enables you to join remotely, as you can see here in this classroom, which we'll talk about more in a second. Our students are actually joining as though they are there in the classroom. So they're there on the screens in front, there are screens behind. Um, it's a state-of-the-art technology that we have in all of the classrooms that our MBA for executive students uh, use uh, to enable them to participate as though they were there in person to, to help uh, make our program continue to be non-transactional, even when not everyone is necessarily able to be here in person. And if you know, as I mentioned, this was piloted several years ago. This is before the pandemic and it enabled us to, to really quickly shift, uh, you know, to when we went fully remote in the uh, spring of 2020 and then, um, you know, a little bit more of a mix last year. Uh, and then this year it's been much more normal where we're again, primarily in person, but the extended classroom is there for you to on a limited basis, have some flexibility and attend remotely on those occasional weekends where you might not be able to make it to New Haven. So as you can see, uh, oh, sorry, Joanne, I wasn't done there. There was one additional thing I was gonna throw out. So, you know, this is a class uh, with Doug Kaiser, by the way, who teaches a climate change course, which is in the sustainability area of focus that, uh, that Emily mentioned earlier. Um, and, and one thing I'll note is that we, uh, you know, while there's many students here in this picture, this picture is from the pandemic. At this point, we generally limit it to about eight students at a time, and there's limitations on how often you can use it. So we intend to continue to be campus-based, but the extend classroom is always there to add that limited uh, degree of flexibility to help you on those weekends where it just doesn't quite come together. So let's talk a little bit, you know, knowing that our program is mostly in person, what the time required on campus is like. Um, so the program itself runs over 22 months uh, and that's primarily in these every other weekend, Friday, Saturday class weekends. So the program itself starts in July. Uh, there are four residency periods or four residency weeks, I should say rather three residency periods over that time where there's a two week orientation residency in July at the start. Then for uh, the rest of year one, you're here August through May, every other weekend on those Friday, Saturday weekends. Um, then in between year one and year two, uh, as Emily mentioned, we have this great opportunity to go on a global network week trip. Uh, and so that is another week in June between year one and year two. And then uh, at the start of year two, uh, there is one more week uh, in residence here in New Haven. Um, and then we resume that every other weekend uh, 
class weekend schedule. So this adds up to a pretty substantial amount of time out of the office over the time that you're in the program. So it's about 60 days out of the office. So as you think about a program and you think about ours, you know, take a look at the calendar. We, we make our academic calendar uh, available in the fall uh, for the following two years. So you get a sense of what the commitment will be. Take a look and, and understand and set expectations both with yourself, but also with your stakeholders, with your organization, with your family, you know, with, with whoever else uh, that, that will be impacted by your, your journey through an MBA for executives program. You know, this is the time commitment that you're going to be making uh, and this is just this is just to actually be here, uh, you know, in person, uh, you know, not even considering the the um, the time beyond that for work. So definitely manageable, but definitely worth thinking about. And now is a great time to, as you plan what the next few years look like, uh, as you hopefully embark in this program. And then finally, I'm going to talk about what the class weekends themselves look like to give you a brief little overview. So uh, we, for us. Our goal, our intention is to offer you as full and rich of an MBA program uh, as possible in this executive format. And so it's quite structured. Emily uh, talked to you through the, the broad overall structure of the program. This is what our class weekends look like. And, and as you can see, they're, they're quite full and again, quite structured. Uh, classes will begin at 9 a.m. on Friday. So many students will come in either Thursday night or early Friday morning to get here and be in class. Uh, the day runs through until 5.30 p.m. Of course, we break for lunch and have other breaks. And, and uh, it's on Fridays when we have colloquium speakers come in uh, many class weekends. And then on Friday evenings, we also have uh, many times these great cross-campus events that our colleagues in the program, program office team put together um, where it's a great opportunity for you to engage really in the life of the school uh, and, and to, to be a really committed non-transactional member of the Yale community. On Saturday, bright and early, 8 a.m. you're back in class so that we can end a little earlier. And we wanna give you as much time as possible to get back uh, to, your, to your family, your friends, to everything else that you have at home. So we start early and end early on Saturdays, but we still uh, often have these great workshops. And again, our colleagues in the program office team put together where we leverage faculty from around, uh, around not just the School of Management, but all around Yale to help you really um, engage in and benefit from uh, some of the richest, most interesting scholarship that happens around the university. And I've always been impressed um, you know, by our students, how after a long week, a long class weekend, uh, continue to be committed and we'll stick around for an extra hour or two after a class weekend is over just to join in these events. So as you think about a program, think about, how am I gonna get there? Think about what is the time commitment like overall? What does the weekend structure look like? And also, um, you know, an executive MBA, no matter where you go, is, is a major commitment. You're putting in a lot of time, you're putting in a lot of money, you're putting in a lot of effort, and you want to get as much as you can out. So think about not just, okay, how can I do the bare minimum? How can I get my classes and get my degree? But think about how you can really engage and benefit from uh, the really rich, both personal, social, and other academic and scholarship opportunities that are available, or scholarly opportunities, I should say, that are available at a school like Yale University. So with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Joanne, who will talk a little bit more about uh, preparedness. Thanks, David. Uh, so, so far, we've gone through three pretty big uh, consideration points, alignment for the programs, getting yourself to campus, thinking about the calendar and the format. And then we're going to move into talking about the preparedness, again, for really any EMBA program. Uh, the points that we bring up here, I think are the ones that we think make the most sense for our program, but I really do think these are quite universal. The first thing to think about is when did you last study with some rigor? It might have been a minute or two since you've last been in school and for our program specifically, but again, we're Generally, uh, EMBA programs tend to be pretty quantitatively heavy. When's the last time that you really studied in a way that used that part of your brain? Uh, we're talking derivatives, valuations, statistics, economics, probability. Uh, when was the last time you did that? And what are you doing to prepare to potentially be back in school, back in study mode? What's your capacity in terms of time? We're gonna talk a little bit more about what that means for your individual stakeholders. But as David mentioned, of course, you're here with us on campus all day Friday, all day Saturday, perhaps coming in even on Thursday night. What's your capacity in terms of time, both for the times that you're here with us on campus or the times that you need to get work done in between the class weekends? Um, you know, on average, we assume students are, are really spending about 50 to 20 hours per week in between the class weekends as well as during the weeks of class weekends. Uh, does your current schedule 
uh, offer that opportunity? And what does that mean in terms of sacrifice? Does it mean you're not maybe going to read a book for a while? Are you going to have to, um, you know, give up that Thursday night poker game or that Saturday morning uh, event that you usually go to, whether it's softball or golf? Um, and what does it mean in terms of your capacity of time at work? So just thinking a little bit about that so that it doesn't sort of feel overwhelming. Uh, what are you doing in terms of keeping up with current events? What business media outlets are you reading? What are you paying attention to? Are you somebody who someone else could pull aside during a class weekend and have a great conversation about the most topical uh, things that are uh, consuming all of us these days? And if not, maybe is that something you need to sort of get ready for to have those conversations in classroom and outside the classroom? Um, what are you gonna do to maximize the time that you are with us in the program? As David mentioned, there's so many opportunities to get involved both at the SOM uh, level as well as the larger Yale University level. Um, how are you going to maximize that time? What are you going to do to make sure you prepare to squeeze everything that you can out out of the program? We're, we're approaching graduation for our program, and we always get students who come up and say, oh, I wish I could have done this. I wish I had had an opportunity to do that. So don't live with that regret. How are you going to make it happen uh, in real time? Um, and then finally, what are your support systems? Who are your champions? Who is going to be supportive of these endeavors? These could be partners, colleagues, supervisors, uh, friends and family. Um, but this is what I think it means to really think about preparedness for any EMBA program. Kind of on that note, you will have stakeholders in your life who are going to sort of need to sign off on this, uh, both formally and informally. And for us, uh, we think about a lot of different stakeholders. I think for, for me, I think about uh, stakeholders at work who are these folks going to be, who are quite literally going to sign off on your time out of the office um, and to give you that permission to be away from the office uh, on Fridays and then potentially on Saturdays if that's part of your work structure currently. Um, we're also thinking about folks at home. So for me, when I say, you know, who are uh, getting your houses in order, getting that workhouse in order, not only up to your boss, but those who supervise and manage as well. How are you gonna manage and delegate on the days that you're not in the office? Um, and then again, at home, who are your family members, your partner, spouses, children, others who are at home? And this concludes your friends and family. This is nobody's solo effort and truly it takes a village to get anybody through an EMBA program. How are you gonna to explain to folks at home what it means for you not to be uh, sort of taking on your share of household duties? How are you going to potentially outsource some of those things if you have the uh, capacity to do that? You definitely don't want anybody surprised that suddenly you're quite limited in your time. So how are you gonna get that approval uh, at home? What does it mean to suddenly rely on others in your life? Perhaps if you're like me, maybe that's a difficult thing is to ask for help. How are you going to set folks up for that eventuality if you are considering a program? And sometimes that can be difficult, but we can't stress this enough. Really, the importance of starting as early as right now to have these conversations and plant these seeds about how this is all going to work so that it's not a year from now when you're about to start to program a program and you think, oh gosh, I have no idea how I'm going to do this. So getting folks set up for this eventuality now, starting to talk through some of those potential road bumps is a really, really good idea. And then, as I mentioned, one of the things that we hear students talk quite a bit about, even this early on, and I appreciate having this conversation early on, is how in the world am I going to pay for this? Doing any EMBA program is not a small thing, both in terms of time and in terms of actual dollars. So as I'm sure you've already sort of figured out, this is not an inexpensive venture. And again, Yale SOM is not alone in this. So thinking about the financing of an MBA, EMBA, is definitely something you wanna think about well ahead of time so that it doesn't surprise you or those again in your stakeholder group uh, at a time when you now suddenly have to make a really difficult decision because the financing isn't there. Uh, so how, you know, folks often ask, how am I gonna pay for this? And the answer is, I'm not sure, but I've got some ideas for you. Uh, some students frankly have out of pocket money uh, that either they are planning on doing this and so maybe it's savings or maybe it's just that they've been planning to do this for a long time and do intend to pay for the program on their own or self-finance it. Again, that might not be a lot of folks, but uh, that definitely comes into consideration. And that is our expectation that students are self-financing the degree for the most part. Uh, we have not announced the entire cost of the program for the next upcoming year, uh, but we're in a similar range with other institutions where we're right around the $200,000 mark. And another thing to think about is what does that include? For us at SOM, that is an all-inclusive cost, and there are ways to reduce that a little bit. But yeah, definitely ask some questions as you're looking at different schools. What does it include, and what might still be extra? For us, we are pretty upfront from the beginning that our cost is all-inclusive. 
Going to scholarship, uh, as you might have noticed if you've done some homework already, MBUF programs don't offer large amounts of scholarships, particularly compared to other academic programs or full-time MBA programs, but we do have a little here and there. So ask that question too. What does it take to be considered for a potential need and or merit-based scholarship? In our case, it definitely means clicking the box in the application that says you'd like to be considered for scholarship. And then we have a combination of factors that we use to determine uh, what that might look like for you individually. We'll do our best to get you that information at the time that you've been admitted to the program uh, so that you have all the information you need at the time that you needed to make the best decision about where to enroll. Hopefully it's with us. Uh, of course, you'll have the opportunity to take out loans. Uh, that's the majority of students who are doing this. It is not an unusual thing to take out loans to finance the MBA. It's a combination of student loans that are government-based and most US and permanent residents, uh, US citizen and permanent residents, excuse me, have the opportunity to be guaranteed loans from the government to get started. Beyond that, if there's still a balance, then you would go into the private loan market and our financial aid team can assist individually with that when the time comes. But do be prepared to be thinking about taking out large sums of money to finance the degree that you will have to pay back over the years. We could talk all day about the return on that investment. But again, we're trying to lessen the shock value of this because the degree is an investment, but certainly we understand that it can be an expensive one. Uh, in terms of employee benefits, find out, start asking around, go to your HR, go to folks who you know might have the answer to this. Does your organization offer you anything uh, in terms of professional development or tuition remission? You might be surprised to find out that in fact they do, and maybe it's only a few thousand dollars or maybe even less than that, but of course, every little bit helps. So find out more about whether or not there might be benefits. You're bringing back such great information from one weekend to another. Uh, your employer is absolutely going to benefit themselves from having all this great knowledge come back week after week. Um, and perhaps they can help uh, finance that opportunity in a way that benefits both parties here. Uh, it is an enormous sum of money. And of course, we are you know, probably thinking, oh gosh, how am I going to pay this big bill? Uh, just so that you know, we do divide this by semesters. So across the 22 months, you will find yourself with four bills. Each one of those will be due at different times of the year and will take into account any loans, scholarships, deposits that you've made. So the, Bennett, the bill may change from one year to another. Yale University does offer flexible payment, payment plans for you to be able to manage that a little bit uh, more easily than just necessarily having to write one big check. The bottom line here is it's really important to be thoughtful now, thoughtful about what you're getting. What does that cost include from one school to another? What additional costs are you going to have to consider? Perhaps that's travel, perhaps that's extra hotel nights. Uh, and what does it mean, again, across each program? Preparing now and getting comfortable with this investment means a lot less emotional hand-wringing at a later time when your emotional capacity to do so might be a little bit more limited because you're so excited, you're so thrilled to be entering the program and suddenly you're hitting a stop sign for financial reasons. So, But please let us know if you have any questions about that because this is a big one. We really encourage you to think about it way ahead of time. I believe I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Liz now to get down and dirty with the nitty gritty of the application to the Yale School of Management specifically, and then we'll take your questions. Liz, this is all yours. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so we did have a question in the chat about uh, timeline and deadlines. Um, so as you can see here, there are three rounds of admission. Um, we don't have rolling admission. So if you are planning to apply for the next class of 2025, you will need to apply by one of these three rounds. Um, so you can see the rough timeline uh, for this coming year on the bottom half of the slide uh, with the three application round deadlines likely to be um, about November, January, and March. Uh, when we have those finalized dates, we will put them on our website. Um, but this chart can just give you a little bit of an idea of uh, the timeline of when you'll apply and ultimately um, when you will hear back from us. So. Uh, each of the application components are listed here as well. Um, we require a resume, um, so this is pretty straightforward. Um, keep it, try to keep it to one to two pages if you're able. Um, there are two essay questions within the application. We require two letters of recommendation, transcripts uh, from all of the schools that you've attended, 
uh, the employer approval form, um, which is for your time away from work to attend uh, the program uh, during those residency periods that we uh, spoke about earlier and the Fridays of class weekends. And like Joanne said, um, possibly Saturdays if, if that's what your work schedule is. Um, the application fee and then a valid test score. So for the standardized test, we accept uh, the GRE, the GMAT or the EA. Uh, if you already have a test score that is valid for five years, um, so you are able to use that uh, for this application if it is still valid. Um, if you have yet to take one of these three exams, um, or if it was more than five years ago, we do highly recommend the EA, um, as it is far more manageable um, for working professionals. It was designed specifically with the MBA in mind, and it's a much shorter exam. So. It is really a great option um, for all of you who are watching this today. So um, if after we review all of these pieces and we want to get to know you more, uh, we will invite you to interview. Um, the interview process really is uh, quite thorough. The day would include a group discussion, um, interviews with a staff member and one of our EMBA alum, uh, alums, um, and a possible meeting with the faculty director for your chosen area of focus. Um, so that is generally uh, what you need for the application. Um, but since we are getting a little close to the end of our webinar, I want to move into the Q&A portion. Um, so you can put your questions. I know there have been some already. Um, you can put them into the Q&A uh, feature or into the chat. Uh, we might not get to everyone's questions today. so. Uh, I definitely encourage you to look back at our website. We record all of our webinars, so you can look back at those. Um, we have our FAQs page on our website, which is really a great resource. Um, or of course, reach out to us by email and we're happy to answer any additional questions uh, that you might have. So Joanne, I'll uh, pass it back over to you. I'll put sure. some of these links into the chat and I might answer some of your questions there um, as well. Thank you so much, Liz. There are a couple of really good questions that we have here. I'm gonna get back to them, but um, I'm also gonna put up this last slide just so that folks know what to do next, um, just in case we run out of time. Um, we would love for you to stay engaged with us, of course, and there's plenty of opportunities to do so. If you haven't yet, it's a great time to do a pre-assessment um, and we could talk a little bit more about that. Liz can put that link in the chat. Uh, we want you to join any virtual information sessions that we have coming up. We're hoping to be back in person for Saturday information sessions on campus, or maybe we'll come to your neck of the woods. Uh, and then finally, if you have any questions for us, you can always email us. Our email address is down there. If there are other folks that might be better for you to talk to, we can help with that as well. So um, Liz, if you have anything else to say about any of those options, please go ahead and chime in, let me know. Um, but I'm wondering if David might feel comfortable chiming in um, about one question that we have in the Q&A about areas of focus. And it's a really good question, um, but the question is, can students take courses from a different area of focus than the one that they have decided to apply to and enroll for. So let's say you're a sustainability person. Could you take uh, some, some classes on asset management? David, I'd love for you to chime in on that. And then I think I might have a, a very, very uh, recent update on that as well, um, specific to these two areas of focus. But generally speaking, David, what do you think? Yeah, so I, I think that there's there's sort of a broader question and then there's a direct question. And the direct question is, you know, can you take the two courses from the two areas? And the short answer to that is unfortunately no, unless you've figured out a way to be in two places at the same time. And I would say, if you have, please let me know. Uh, that would be very helpful to me. But uh, all these courses are taking place at the same time. As you remember from that class weekend structure, it's very structured. And so when you are in your asset management classes, your peers will be in their sustainability class. However, there is a giant asterisk though, because while you are not able to participate in these courses live, that content is generally not gated from you. And the broader question is, you know, if you can benefit from the, the areas of focus that uh, are also offered other than your particular area of focus, the answer to that question is yes. So most of our course content is recorded. It's available to all of our students. So, you know, you may be in your area of focus course at the same time, that another area of focus is courses are happening, but you can go back and watch those recordings after the fact. And then beyond that, you spend 75% of the, the program 
with students from not just your area of focus, but from across all three. So, um, you know, you aren't able to participate live, but you do have that content there. And there's so many great opportunities for cross-pollination between the areas of focus. So the short answer, no. The broader answer, yes. And there's some really great opportunities for you to take advantage of the, the other areas that your peers are engaged in. Thanks, David. And I can just uh, quickly let you know, specifically between uh, asset management and sustainability, we absolutely recognize the intersection there is becoming more and more prominent. We're getting more and more questions from students whose work finds them at the intersection of sustainability and uh, financing or investments, particularly if you have clients who are scrambling for answers to how are you investing sustainably? How are you investing responsibly? Uh, and so there's a clear intersection and need to address that. And our faculty are doing so as we speak. So I do think in the future, we may see some cross classes where the sustainability and asset management areas of focus actually come together for a common class uh, taught by areas of focus directors or faculty from, from each of those. We do want to acknowledge that we understand where that question specifically may have come from. And while we do acknowledge there might be crossovers with healthcare and sustainability or healthcare and financing as well. This is the one that I think we're focusing on uh, at the moment with the, again, demand from clients uh, for uh, answers about how companies are taking, uh, tackling things like climate change. Uh, terrific uh, question here too about where folks stay or what the accommodations are like. Um, we've got a really good answer to that because we've got a terrific uh, accommodation situation in the Omni Hotel, which is just downtown in New Haven, about a mile and change away from the School of Management, definitely walkable, and that is included in the cost of the sort of sticker price for the program. Should you choose to opt out of housing, perhaps you're just not a hotel person, maybe you live close enough, maybe you wanna make your own arrangements, you can certainly do that. And that's where the variability in the cost of the program may come from. We do find that students benefit quite a bit from all staying at the same hotel, first of all, uh, and second of all, benefit from the time that it takes to bond with each other. Uh, and they're maybe going out for dinner afterwards, or maybe even uh, getting together socially, going to the gym together, and staying in the same place means you're walking to school with your classmates every day or hopping into an Uber to get to campus every day. So while there is some choice and variability there, the Omni Hotel takes very good care of our students uh, and offers a hot breakfast on Saturday morning um, and all of the needs that you would anticipate at a full service hotel. So um, yeah, uh, it's, a, it's just been renovated. So feel free to hop on their website and take a look at some photos as well. Um, we have about two minutes left. Liz, did you have any questions that came through uh, that you'd like to quickly throw out at us that we can answer in, in 30 seconds? Yeah, um, so Joanne, somebody did ask, um, what is the recommended EA score or is there oh. something that you should target? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, over the years that we've started to accept the EA as one of the possible standardized test score options, uh, we've noticed and come together sort of as a school and as an industry and in EMBA program to determine that a 150 on the EA is a good target uh, to shoot for as you are preparing for the EA. And of course, the maximum score is a little bit higher than that. But we've determined that over uh, the years in some validity testing that that most accurately predicts success in the classroom for an EMBA program. So as you're thinking about it, uh, shooting for that score is terrific. A 10 on each subsection is also recommended. If you fall a little short of that, you're certainly welcome to call us and we can help to determine whether a retake is the best course of action or perhaps some additional quantitative preparation might uh, take the place of doing a retake of the exam. So don't be afraid to come talk to us, be candid about your score, and we're happy to give some direct advice about what you might wanna do next if you don't quite reach that threshold. If you get over that threshold, you're done. Uh, you can go ahead and feel confident that your score is within the range. Of course, a test score is just one piece of an otherwise extremely holistic process. That means getting a not so great score doesn't necessarily preclude you from admission. And similarly, a terrific score won't over um, won't allow us to overlook weaknesses elsewhere in an application. So we do encourage you to do the best you can. We're going to have a webinar very soon about the EA specifically. So stay tuned for that. We're going to partner with our friends from the GMAC organization to talk not only about what the score can mean in the context of a holistic admission, process, um, but also specifically about uh, where the test came from and how it was crafted. Um, and I just see one final question here about the acceptance rate into the program. That's not something that we offer out uh, specifically and publicly, so I don't have a great answer for you there. And if you have any questions for us, I see somebody saying, can we contact someone? Sure. Our admissions email address is right here 
emma.admissions at yale.edu. The four of us are constantly in that inbox looking for opportunities to connect with students who might have questions. A pre-assessment is also a terrific way to get some uh, individualized feedback from one of the four of us and a great way to start a relationship with someone. Come to campus, introduce yourself to one of us, come to any events that we have live, introduce yourself to one of us. We're eager to develop relationships with every candidate so that we can best advise you on your next steps. I think our time is up. So I wanna thank Liz, David and Emily for being such wonderful colleagues and partners with me today on this first webinar, kicking off our next recruitment cycle for the class of 2025. We truly look forward to hearing more from you from a pre-assessment, meeting you in person or seeing you on our next webinar. So thanks again to everybody for being here today. We look forward to seeing you at our next event.